Hello? Hi, Susie. It's Paul here. How are you? Enjoying your new job? You're working at the library, aren't you? Yes. I started when the library reopened a month ago. It's great. Actually, Carol and I have been meaning to join for a while. Oh, you should. It doesn't cost anything, and the new library has all sorts of facilities. It's not just a place where you borrow books. For instance, there's an area with comfortable seats where you can sit and read the magazines they have there. Some people spend the whole morning there. Mm, wish I had that amount of time to spend. <laughs> yes, you must be pretty busy at present, with the children and everything. We are, yes. But we're hoping to get away this summer. We're thinking of going to Greece. Well, we've got a much larger section of the library devoted to travel books now, so you should come and have a look. I can't remember if there's anything specifically on Greece, but I should think so. OK. Now, Carol's organising a project for the history class she teaches at school. It's about life in the town a hundred years ago. Do you have anything that might be useful? Yes. Actually, we've now got a new section with materials on the history of the town and surrounding region. Right. I'll tell her. You can't always find that sort of thing on the internet. Now, in the old library, there used to be a separate room with reference books. It was a really nice, quiet room. Yes. We've put those books in the main part of the library now. But we do have a room called the community room. It can be hired out for meetings, but at other times, people can use it to study. I might use that. It's hard to find anywhere quiet at home sometimes. I can't remember how old your son and daughter are. We've introduced a special section of fiction written specially for teenagers, but they might be a bit young for that. Yes, they would be. Well, we do have lots of activities for younger children. Yes. For example, we have a science club. At the next meeting, they're going to be doing experiments with stuff that everyone has in the kitchen, sugar and flour and so on. They might be interested, yes. And we have a competition for children called Reading Challenge. That doesn't begin until after the end of term. They have to read six books, and they get a certificate if they manage it. So that gives them something to do while they're on holiday, instead of getting bored. That's the idea. And there's special activities for adults, too. On Friday, we have a local author called Tanya Streep, who's going to be talking about her new novel. It's called Catch the Mouse. And she based the story on a crime that actually took place here years ago. Right. We're not free on Friday, but I'll look out for the book. Now, this probably isn't for you, but we do have IT support available for members. We get quite a few older people coming along who are wanting to get up to speed with computer technology. It's on Tuesday mornings. They don't need to make an appointment or anything. They just turn up. Well, my mother might be interested. I'll let her know. OK. And there's another service which you wouldn't expect from a library, which is a free medical checkup. The hospital arranges for someone to come along and measure the level of sugar in your blood, and they check cholesterol levels at the same time. Really? Yes, but that's only for the over 60s, so you wouldn't qualify. OK. Well, I'll tell my mother. She might be interested. What other information? Well, we do have a little shop with things like wall charts and greetings cards, and also stamps, so you can post the cards straight away, which is really useful. Yeah. Well, I'll bring the children round at the weekend and we'll join. Oh, one more thing. I'll be bringing the car. Is there parking available? Yes. And it's free in the evening and at weekends. Perfect. Well, thanks, Sue. Good afternoon. This is the first of a series of lectures I'll be giving about engineering for sustainable development.
I'll be presenting examples of engineering projects from a variety of contexts and today I'm going to talk about a project to design a new kind of greenhouse for use in the Himalayan mountain regions. First of all, I'll tell you about the problem which was the context for this project. In the Himalayan mountains, fresh vegetables and other crops can only be grown outside for about 90 days during the summer because the altitude of the region is around 3,500 meters and because the rainfall is so low. In winter, temperatures fall below minus 25 degrees centigrade so fresh vegetables have to be imported. They arrive by truck in summer or by air in winter, which makes them expensive. Local people rely on dried leafy vegetables and stored root crops during the winter and rarely eat fresh vegetables. But despite the sub-zero temperatures, the skies over the region are cloudless and there are over 300 sunny days per year. So, an engineering solution was needed to exploit the sun's energy and protect locally produced plants from freezing during winter. And in fact, there had been programs in the past to provide greenhouses, but these were unsuccessful. The greenhouses weren't adapted for local conditions, so they tended to fall into disuse. So, a few years ago, a project was initiated to design a better greenhouse, one which would meet the criteria for sustainability. So what are the criteria for sustainability? Well, first of all, the new greenhouse is designed to be relatively simple, so construction is cheap. Locally available materials are used wherever possible. The walls are generally constructed of mud bricks, made locally, although in areas of high snowfall, more resilient walls of stone are needed. Rammed earth is also used. The main roof is generally made from locally available poplar wood, with water-resistant local grass for the covering. In addition, the construction and maintenance of the greenhouse is done by local craftsmen, so local stonemasons are employed to build the greenhouse walls and specialized training is provided for them wherever necessary. Then, the greenhouse is designed to run on solar power alone. There's no supplementary heating. And lastly, families are selected to own one of the new greenhouses with great care. They have to have a site which is suitable for constructing it on they also have to be keen to make a success of using it and also to share the produce with the wider community through sale or barter. Potential owners are taken to see existing greenhouses before they make a final decision about having one. So, those are the features which make the project sustainable. And now, I'll briefly describe the design of the greenhouse. The greenhouses are orientated very carefully along an east-west axis so that there's a long south-facing side. The transparent cover on the south-facing side is made from a heavy-duty polythene, which should last for at least five years. On the inside of the greenhouse, the walls are painted. The rear and west-facing walls are black to improve heat absorption but the east-facing wall is white to reflect the morning sunlight onto the crops inside. Finally, there's a door in the wall at one end, and vents are incorporated into the roof, the door, and the wall at the other end to enable control of humidity and prevent overheating. I'll turn now to the benefits which have resulted from the introduction of these new greenhouses. These benefits are of various kinds, but for now, I'll just mention the social benefits. First of all, people who own a greenhouse gain social standing in their communities because they provide vegetables for the wider community, for regular consumption, as well as for festivals, and they also earn income. Secondly, 
Because in rural areas it is women who usually grow the food, the greenhouses have increased their opportunities. They bring the benefits of improved nutrition and increased family income from the sale of surplus produce. And thirdly, as a result of their improved financial position, some families can now afford to educate their children for the first time. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic, and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Mm. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters? Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. OK. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> But if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library, mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable. Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out 15 instead of the usual 10 books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do. But I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh, yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Dr Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month. Oh. It's the holidays. 
You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah. But I suppose I can get a lot of support from course mates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out, what the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. OK. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to... Hello, Brian Park speaking. Oh, hello. I'm calling about the advert in the paper. For the car? Uh, yes, the Mini you've got advertised for sale. Oh, yes. I just wanted to find out a bit more information. Of course. What would you like to know? It's my brother who's interested, actually. But he's not in today, so he asked me to call you. Fine. Great, thanks. So, it's a Mini? Yep. And how old is it? Just coming up to 13 years old. And I seem to remember from the ad that it's grey. That's it. Doesn't show the dirt. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, the colour shouldn't be a problem for Jeff. You know, the important thing is the quality. Yes, of course. And what about mileage? With it being pretty old, it's probably over 100,000? Actually, it's 40,000 less than that. 62,000 on the clock. Great. I remember now. I'm confusing it with another ad I was looking at. Right. Pleasant surprise then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been the only owner or was there a previous one? I'm the second one. Before, it was owned by a teacher who was a very careful driver. Didn't have any accidents. Very good. And what about you? What do you tend to use it for? I haven't used it all that much, mostly for shopping. You know, the sort of thing. So, not much wear and tear. I'll make a note of that. I know Jeff wanted me to check that. Right. Now, about the price, I see you've got it down as £1,250. I'm not sure Jeff will be able to come up with that amount. In the ad, I did say 1250 or nearest offer. So, would you be prepared to go down to... 1,000? That's really too low, I'm afraid. 1,100? I might be able to go to that. OK, I'll make a note of that. What about tax? Is it due soon? Got another five months before it's due. Oh, that's a real plus, yes. I'll make a note of that. OK. Now, you say it's in good condition. For its age, I'd say yes, definitely. It's just been serviced and there were no major problems. Major? I'd be able to show you the service report. The only thing is, you'd have to get a new tyre in the near future. Though it's still OK, you know. It's certainly absolutely safe at the moment. OK, fair enough. Yes, I understand. And the garage also mentioned that one headlight could probably do with replacing. They think there's a fault there, you know, intermittent... Well, we'd obviously look at all the documents, but that sounds very straightforward. Of course. I've got all the service documents up to date, and you can look at those. Well, it all sounds pretty good, and I know my brother will be interested. So, would it be possible for him to see the car? He's back from his trip tomorrow, and away tonight. So, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow? Wednesday? I'm, I'm afraid that's not possible. I'm out pretty much all day. Well, Thursday then? That'd be fine, yeah. In the morning? Yes, that'd suit me perfectly. Great. Now, you'll need my address. Oh, yes, of course. What is it? It's number 238. 238? London Road. Oh, that's easy enough. Yes, very straightforward. So, I'll pass on these notes to Jeff, 
and he'll see Dubai Palm Apartments, Amanda speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Amanda. I'm ringing to inquire about a holiday apartment for the month after next. OK, no problem. Let me get your details first, then I'll tell you what we've got. Is that all right? Fine, go ahead. OK. Can I have your name first, please? Yes, it's Leo Blücher. That's L-E-O, that's my first name, and my surname is B-L-U-C-H-E-R. OK, I've got that. Where are you from, just out of interest, Leo? I'm Austrian. Right, OK. And what's your address? It's number 37, Blumengasse, in Vienna. Right, could you just spell Blumengasse for me, please, Leo? My German's not too good. Sure. It's B-L-U-M-E-N-G-A-S-S-E. Great. Thanks. And what's the weather like in Vienna at the moment? It's pretty grey and rainy, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hope it's better in Dubai. Yes, it's lovely at the moment. Sunny and warm, but not too hot. Now, can you give me your phone number? Yes, it's 4312-11057. Great. So, you're looking for a holiday apartment, Leo. How many people is it for? Just yourself? No, there'll be four of us, two adults and two children. Fine. And when would you like it from? Ideally from the 1st of January. January the 1st. OK. I'll have a look and see what we've got. How long would you like to stay? Well, it depends a little bit on the price, but I think that about nine days would be perfect. Fine. And talking of prices, what would be your maximum, do you think? Well, I've looked on the internet, but I don't know if I'm being realistic if I say 200 euros per day. Uh, things seem to range from 150 to well over 400. Well, it depends where, of course, but I think we could probably find something for you at that price. Great. There are various other things, though. Our children are quite small, and we don't want to take them to restaurants all the time. So one thing we'd really appreciate is a fully equipped kitchen so we can do some cooking. Yes, I completely understand. Do you have any other special requirements? Yes, we live in the city centre, hundreds of miles from the sea, so we'd really like to be able to see it from our apartment. OK, I'll note that down. All our apartments come with air conditioning and central heating, by the way. Oh dear, one thing I don't like is the noise of air conditioning in the background. Can you make sure it's as quiet as possible? Yes, I'll look into that. Anything else? Yes, just one more thing. Uh, we'd like to hire a car while we're in Dubai, so we'll need to have a parking space, I think. We don't want to have to walk a long way from the car to the apartment. I think you're quite right. I'll look into all these things and make a list of possible apartments. Do you have an email address so I can send them to you? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, 
approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator along with the type of surface you're painting and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room, so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high-quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy, so washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. 
In tomorrow's program, I'll be giving some advice on... We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings, and I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment or for education or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. This includes its physical location, obviously, but it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for. And finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal, which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison, he found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So, how was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up and the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see, the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building, that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains, which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, they criticised the style of the design as being international rather than local 
and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built.